Hi everyone, tonight is Thursday, August 25th, 2016, and this is our second and actually final uh, meeting of the facilitation team that will be hosting the second Open ABE MOOC. Um, I think we've got about nine of the 15 of us um, on tonight that will be facilitators, so welcome everybody. Um, and as, as I told uh, before we started here, I told ask everybody to mute their microphones, but certainly don't take that to mean don't talk. If you want to talk, please uh, you know, unmute and certainly um, make your comments and questions. Last time we met, it was kind of the world according to Jennifer, and I very much want a different focus tonight um, for us to be able to have this chance to, um, to share and compare our ideas. So uh, first of all, I just do want to thank everybody so much. I, I just so appreciate all the time that you volunteer during the course and the preparation and even in the debriefing afterwards. Um, it's, just, it's just very amazing that um, we've been able to assemble such a wonderful team and, and get such great interest. Um, as far as the agenda for tonight, I just want to um, get on everybody's calendars the important dates that are coming up. Just a reminder, I don't think there are really many new dates, but just reminders, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, we'll talk a little bit about enrollments, what we have so far, and some ideas of, of how we can kind of keep plugging away and, and getting our word out to others. And then um, under the category we had last time, and I, I kind of laugh about it, calling it homework to you guys. It makes me kind of chuckle <laughs> designing homework. But um, the idea being hopefully last time, since last time you had the opportunity to log into Canvas, um, get a sense of what your role is and what the moderation schedule is for the um, facilitators. Had a chance to hopefully peek at OER Commons, look at the design guide, um, and, and if you're not already, um, take some time to familiarize yourself with both um, the college and career readiness standards as well as the first principles of instruction, which kind of underlie the, um, the instructional theory that we're, we're basing our course on. Um, so with that, I'll, I'd just like to take a pause and um, knowing that that's the agenda of things we're going to talk about, is there anything that I missed within that that folks would like to um, take some time to talk about tonight? See, this is the risk of having everybody mute their mics. <laughs> like nobody says anything. And also just do remember too, we've got the text chat. I'll try to open that up for myself. So if you want to... Um, type something in and as I'm talking or others are talking. Okay, well, I'm going to assume since nobody unmuted that we were good to go. Um, so let's all just give ourselves a little round of applause here. We've got <laughs> 842 that enrolled and it's pretty close to where we started last, uh, last class. And um, it's a little disappointing. Canvas Network, if, I don't know if you've had a chance to hop over to their website, we're like well below the fold. So you actually have to hit, I think twice, you have to hit load more to actually find our class on the front page. And I'm pretty sure last time we were much more prominently displayed. So I'm going to write to Hillary this week and see if maybe we could get ourselves bumped up because um, I think that's really where we saw the jump. I think last year at one point we were number one in the search uh, or on the page when people came, and that's when we went from like 1,000 to 2,000 in, in about a week and a half. Um, so hopefully we can, uh, we can improve on that. Um, but as far as important dates, um, th as I mentioned um, last time, and I'll just reiterate now, this is our last official facilitator meeting. So in some respects, speak now or forever hold your peace as far as um, questions you may have about, about your role or how the class will be run. Um, certainly that does not preclude you from sending me emails or trying to <laughs> back channel me or talk to me. But as far as a formal meeting, this will this will pretty much be it. Um, and just as a reminder, uh, as we stand right now, the class does run for 12 weeks, starting September 12th through the 4th of December. Um, and then if you click on the link, um, does everybody have, I'm going to put it in the text chat just to make sure. Um, here is a link to the presentation we're working off of right now in case you don't have it. So you're able to click on those links. Um, let's see, what was I going to say? Uh, oh yeah, the, sub, uh, the live webinar schedule. So if you click on the link that's on this page right here, it will take you to an Eventbrite um, page and you'll be able to see the pull downs for the live webinars that we've scheduled very much in the same vein of, of what we did last class where um, we'll assemble a small group each time, a little bit ad hoc, not necessarily something I can schedule now because it's kind of based on where I perceive or we perceive the students are struggling. Um, we talked a little bit about it before we started recording tonight. Students really were struggling with understanding the context of what an open education, oh, open, I'm sorry, not an open, um, an adult basic education 
um, learning environment looks like. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about um, the learners and what their motivations may be, the real world context. Um, that they may uh, be pursuing their education, whether it be for uh, work prep or for college readiness or whatever it may be. Um, so those, that's that type of uh, agenda item for the, the live webinars is something that we establish once the, the class is underway and see where folks are at. Um, and then something I didn't um, explicitly mention, mention dates last time, but um, it is kind of important because a lot of us will be affected by this. Um, our AECT conference is October 17th through 24, and I think a, a, at least probably almost half of us will be there. Maybe not quite a half, but a third at least. Um, and then uh, many of us are also at Open Ed 16, which is in November um, 2nd through the 4th. So we'll have to kind of balance some uh, coverage during that time. Obviously, we'll all be connected, but it's a matter of how much time we'll have, each have to devote to the class. And then um, it's kind of exciting. Um, we are going to have our first fundraiser on uh, for the nonprofit designers for learning. Um, fall fundraiser starting in um, in November, and we're going to have on November 12th a 12-hour webcast-a-thon. And we've already sent out inv invites. Um, we'd like to have one featured speaker every hour. Um, they'll speak through a question and answer time and then have the opportunity for others to uh, step in and answer questions. And the theme of our um, our fundraiser and kind of our looking forward into next year is what impact will you make? Um, because we very much view what we do as a nonprofit is allowing people to, through, um, to make an impact through service learning. And uh, so that's what we've asked our speakers to focus on, what impact they've made, what impact they feel is needed in the field of education, and some of the initiatives that they're working on. Um, so that's that. Um, so in terms of promoting the MOOC, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna go a little bit quickly through some of this because it's repetitive. Um, if you haven't done so already, um, if you wouldn't mind hopping over to some of these places um, that you may be already part of, for example, if you're on Twitter, if you wouldn't mind uh, making sure you book my, or your friend, rather, um, Designers for Learning. And if you do talk about the course, we use the hashtag um, OpenABE. Um, we also have then uh, fairly large but not necessarily active groups on Google Plus community. We have a Facebook group and then also a LinkedIn group um, that you're certainly welcome to to join in and hopefully <laughs> we'll hopefully get a little bit more community discussion going in some of those um, external platforms as, as um, the semester goes along. Um, and then if you are looking for a link to point people to regarding the course um, where we tend to um, point most people is designersforlearning.org slash openabe MOOC and that contains a frequently asked questions page as well as then a link to how they can enroll in the course. And with that, now I'm really going to stop talking and just kind of prompt for discussion. Um, let's start out with Canvas access. Um, can we just take a quick poll? Has everybody been able to successfully log in, or conversely, is there anyone who's been unable to log into the course? I haven't been able to log in. Oh, okay. Um, and part of the problem might be um, because I was I took the course last time. So okay. So I wonder if I'm using, you know, I'll back channel you um, when we get off here. I'll send you an email. Um, is there a preferred, you don't have to give it, you don't have to articulate it now. But. It's, all over the, it's all over the internet. Oh, so. okay. okay. I didn't want to like, <laughs> like the email, but um, is there yeah. a preferred email you, you'd like me to set it up under? Um, I think you sent it to my carsonct.com. Um, that one's fine. Oh, okay. And so you tried to log on and it didn't work? No. Um, and I wonder, if because I used that before for my other login, does that matter? You know, it could also be user error on my part. Part That was with Janet. I think, Janet, I missed like a, a, a letter or something in yours. And poor Janet and I were going back and forth. And it was actually my fault. I just typed it wrong. So let me go back and make sure okay. I've entered it. But it's, it's the same one that I've been sending you stuff to then. Okay. Yeah. And I've been getting that. So. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know. I can also give you another email address. So, okay. I, let me just check my typing skills because that may be actually what uh, that's what happened with Janet. I, we had we had a back and forth uh, where I couldn't figure out what was going on, and then I noticed I transposed some letters. I think. Um, okay, looks you like everybody a, else. You have a few other things on your plate. <laughs> Go a little too fast sometimes. Yeah. 
slow down. Um, okay, looks like that's good. I am not seeing any no's in the chat room and no one and mentioning it. Um, so what, what we've been, first of all, I skip the screen here. Uh, that's what it looks like, by the way. Like when you come into the course, um, it depends on how you choose to bookmark it, but it's learn.canvas.net slash courses and then the number for our course for this, um, yeah, 12, yeah, 1233. And hang on one second. I'm just going to mute it. Mute. Hang on a second. Um, Jennifer, the message I get is this course has not been published by the instructor yet. Ah, okay. So I think I, I probably did type it wrong. Cause that's, isn't that, Janet, isn't that the same message you were getting? Yeah, I think that's my, it sounds like that's pointing to uh -huh. an issue on my end then. Okay. Okay, so I'll, I'll fix that as soon as we're done. So what I'd like um, us to spend a little bit of time talking about is um, those that have had time to, to poke around in the course a little bit, any of your thoughts on where you would like me to spend some additional time working on things. Uh, you know, we've talked about the learning context in module one. Um, I'd love for everybody to spend quite a bit of time on module two since we kind of blew it, blew it apart and started over from the last time. Um, and then we also do have the group collaboration option, which is now in there, and then also the bonus challenge. So if I could point you to areas to help me look at, those would be the areas. But is there anything else that uh, folks would like to raise as places you'd like me to look at? Any thoughts? Jared, did you have a chance to look at module three? Are you okay? I made some, you know, that was your, your section. Um, I didn't change it as much as I just pulled it apart from what you had with Stacy. And I've, you know, I've tried to maintain what you had. And I, I think I moved a couple of the exercises um, to a supplementary area. So it's not part of the main section, but we've got now a supplementary material section. Yeah, I think it looks like kind of mostly the same. And I, I think I provided some feedback. Like, has it changed in the, the last week or so? Um, it did yesterday a tick. Oh, uh, okay. I'll, I, okay, I'll need to go back in and just kind of. And not a, a lot. I, I flip-flopped. Um, I, I put OER first and Creative Commons second. I thought I'd yeah. leave with like what OER is and then describe how you achieve, how you basically create an OER through mm -hmm. Creative Commons. Yeah, I thought like the like if it hasn't been that much of a change when I saw before, I thought it had had a good flow to it. Okay. So, yeah. And then Janet, um, I just I, you and I have never had a chance to talk. I assigned you as a moderator to um, the bonus challenge. Is that okay? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I've had a chance to look at it, and in the next week, I'm going to. Um, really flesh out my own what I, what I did uh, in the first run of the course. I'm going to take that lesson and see what some brainstorming thoughts are for putting it into um, in, in there so that I have experience to stand on. But I feel good about that. So yes, count on me. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And just for yeah. everybody else's, um, uh, as a reminder, we did set up a, a separate sandbox outside of the main shell of the course. And I know, Janet, you've been in there, and it's been great. Susan Jones has been really rolling up her sleeves. So that's the area where a lot of the discussion about the bonus module is happening. We got some great feedback from her. Um, another prior student didn't have a chance to finish the lesson, but had some really good observations as far. It's, it's very a stark difference between how we do the first, but the first part of the course to me is much more hand-holding as far as, okay, now turn this in, now, now think about this, now do a reflection, versus the bonus challenge is a little bit more of a free-for-all, where it's like, do what you want, and here's some resources on uh, that may help you um, with a, a lot less scaffolding that, than we have in the first part of the class. So here's the beach, a shuffle, and a pail. Go at it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and it's also it's also a different way of looking at your lesson. I mean, I feel like what what we did the first um, time around is we we created a lesson for an instructor, but this time it's more you know um, creating the modules and, and putting it in a different framework. So. So it does take a different approach, and I think that's where my role will come in with some brainstorming and some, some thoughts about how to change lessons into actual, um, you know, um, Canvas modules. 
And that was actually some feedback that, um, and certainly I'd love your help on this too, Janet, if you could think of any even verbiage to articulate exactly what you said. Um, yeah. That came up from Susan as well as um, yes. David in the course. He said there needs to be some, some um, mind shift. Uh, exactly like you said, the first thing we created were lesson plans pretty much primarily to, to, for a face-to-face -face classroom you know, potentially some online modules that you may use in like a hybrid or blended type context, but for the most part, a lesson plan for the instructor. Um, and so we just need to get a paragraph or two together to, to get that I'll, transition. I can do that for sure. That yeah, I can help you with that for sure. Helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And then um, we'll, we'll leave this topic unless anybody wanted to uh, talk about it. But again, it's just mainly a plea an ongoing plea to continue to look for goofy things that you may find. I'm always having those heart stopping moments when I go in the course and I realize like a, a module page is out of order. And I, you know, it's kind of like reading a proofing your own paper and you think you're done. And then it's like, Oh no, if I missed this, what else did I miss? Um, so in terms of, um, the facilitation, I, I would like to spend a fair amount of time making sure we're all pretty comfortable with how this works. I, I use this analogy to like pit stop when you're driving across the country that students are going to be passing through your module, hopefully in a numerical order, but not necessarily. Um, I think for the most part they did last time, but some of them are a little bit longer and some linger and some don't quite get to your module. Um, so just kind of be, be prepared for that. So um, with that in mind, when I put the um, discussion schedule together, um, in fact, I'll open it right now. I did my best to try to guesstimate where students will eventually land on your module, or at least the bell curve, the peak of the bell curve, when most people will um, arrive at your, your, your module. Um, and this is what's, um, hopefully you can see this, that's what's reflected on this um, schedule here. So as I mentioned last time, if you, do think you will have a conflict in your schedule? And I know, Janet, that you, you mentioned you were going to be at ACT, and I totally missed that. So, or was it open ed, whichever. Um, I, I moved you. So if, if it appears any of the dates um, will conflict with some major happening you have in your life, do let me know, and, and we'll try to get things, um, things moved around. Uh, but for the most part, this is exactly what we saw last week. So I'll just pause a second. Did anybody have any questions on how this whole process works? And what, I know we have a lot of folks that were, with us last time, but some of the folks that are newer may not, this may be kind of a hard <laughs> concept to get your head around until you've actually seen it in practice. Were there any questions? Or comments from others who may want to explain better than I am what, what this process looks like? I, I guess I'm, I'm assuming it's similar to other courses I facilitated where you you may, you may have discussions. Yep, it's exactly right. And, and I feel bad because you haven't seen the class. It's exactly it. So every module <laughs> concludes with a discussion with prompted questions. And um, based on what the discussion is, then it, the, the moderator is either kind of furthering the conversation if it seems like people are kind of not getting it or maybe giving to, uh, and suggestions of resources they may want to consider. Um, so it kind of depends on what your question prompt is or, or where people are in the course. Um, but the, the main idea being, uh, like, let's say for example, where are you at? You're in module two. So the main mm -hmm. idea being, you're certainly welcome to participate in any of the discussion modules. It, you know, in fact, I encourage it so you get a general sense of where people's heads are at in the class and what types of um, things they're struggling with. Uh, mm -hmm. But for the most part, the module that you're, and I'm putting it in quotes, responsible for is the module that you're assigned. So once people get to your module, that's kind of where you'll spend most of your time fielding those. It's kind of like the hit stop crew of, of that module. Okay. And could somebody, maybe somebody that had been in the class before, could you kind of help me out as far as like, how was your perception of how this worked last time and how, like the types of questions that you would be involved in and, and comments and, and uh, facilitation feedback you'd give within your module? Well, Jennifer, what I did was uh, I'd go to the SME section and if I didn't find, or if I did find uh, questions there, I would address them. But I tried to keep track with uh, throughout the course, but especially 
uh, during the weeks that I was assigned to comments that were being made uh, by facilitators and students. And if I found that there were students who were not being responded to or issues that I particularly have uh, an issue with, uh, I would drop in along with the facilitators and, and try to promote discussions. Uh, I found that sometimes uh, students didn't want to adhere to what I had suggested and I wouldn't push it. But on the other hand, many were and uh, I found it to be a real learning experience for them and for me. So it's kind of like mm, navigating the whole course, finding little gaps here and there, uh, regardless of our uh, whether we're facilitators, SMEs. That's how I looked at it. Yeah. And, uh, I, I could oh, sorry, say, Virginia, go ahead. Oh, uh, I just I want to commend Lisi and, and everyone who was um, facilitating the first round. Uh, I want to say that, that the positive responses I was receiving as, and also questions. Um, JR asked me questions about why not have my, um, my students read aloud. He asked me to kind of talk about why I felt that way and to back that up. And that was a wonderful challenge for me to, to uh, put my thoughts into words. So when I go about um, facilitating, I think that I'll take the same approach. I mean, uh, the positive encourager, but also someone who um, will ask good questions uh, and, and encourage people to engage. I think some people kind of might, might not feel as included if we don't uh, thoughtfully ask those questions. So I just, I wanted to thank uh, Lisi and JR, thank you so much for your feedback because I feel like at certain points I, I thought, oh, I don't know if I can get this done. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, um, but, but you really did help me and, and made me feel capable uh, at points where I, I was um, wavering a little. So I, I, I hope that I can be that way for someone else. That's really a great point. We, we do have to remember that there are no prerequisites in this class and so a lot of folks don't know what they don't know. And I think that gets to your point, Janet, like they may not be able to articulate a question they have. And Felice, this ties into also what Felice just mentioned in the uh, chat room. A lot of times people are just posting something and, and just asking for feedback. And so I think that's a great opportunity to do is the, the technique that JR had done that Janet mentioned is just say, you know, probing questions, you know, why, you know, can I ask why you did this or, you know, cool thing you, you tried why are you why are you doing this versus another trying to get them to reflect and that's really the, the idea with the, the reflection questions that are um, in individual assignments that they have as well as in the discussion is just to get them thinking about why they're doing things um, and, I, and I felt that the the timely responses were excellent I mean I know that that's expecting a lot that we would respond to so many people so quickly but uh, I think that the facilitators did a great job of, of quickly responding when I had questions or when I you know I responded back to JR he, he wrote right back so it was it was thrilling to, to be able to make that connection and have it happen so quickly and you know that ties into um, another point that I think we all struggle with as educators teaching in an online environment is that balance between um, is it a dialogue between the facilitators and, the, and an individual student or how much peer to peer can we encourage and um, I was pretty pleased in general, considering it's obviously a group of people that doesn't know each other, <laughs> that um, I think there was a pretty fair uh, amount of um, a peer-to-peer -peer feedback and, and I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are uh, those that were in the class last time and and maybe ways that we could encourage that again in this next class I think I can jump in on this one because the the, the approach that I used last time was maybe similar to what Lisi did where normally I just hop into the, the help forum and then back into whatever week we were in at the time but if I had a sense of you know, who's kind of like doing a math related thing or who is doing a, an English language arts related thing. Even if I didn't really know the fine details of their project, I sometimes would bump into another uh, participant that was doing something similar. I, like some of the ones that kept coming up were like travel plans. Um, and so then I was able to say, oh, like you should also then connect with so-and-so. Like if you haven't seen their post, they're working on a similar project or on a similar topic. And so that's, it's a, a soft way to try to make some of those connections. 
Um, and you know what, JR, you bring up a really great point um, as far as um, trying to make connections among people as well as um, part, parts of the course. <laughs> and um, it's not great. And in fact, Lisey and I had quite a, a nice conversation at the end, kind of a debriefing conversation of how, I think she sent me an email of some of the frustrations we have. It's, inherent when you have what what would you, when it, we ended up with what 2100 people I think in the last class so um, trying to sort through the discussion forums and try to remember who said what or whatever it gets pretty hard but it there's a somewhat decent search feature within each discussion module and I circled it here on this um, on this diagram here you can search by author so if you happen to remember the name of the person you were working with but probably more likely it will be some keyword that you remember um, like for example I, I know I was trying to reach a bunch of the, the Purdue students last time wanted to form a small cohort and that's just one thing that pops into my mind right now I just went into the search bar and typed in Purdue and then it pulls up all the posts associated with that um, so that may be something to help us but it the canvas discussion forms are not the best I've ever seen and I have articulated that to the canvas people but certainly they're not going to change them for Jennifer um, it's, it's, I, you know they, they took my feedback but um, what I think I found to be the most helpful for me as far as navigating the discussion forum was to go into an individual forum. You can see over on the right, um, you can tell where your unread posts or forums that have unread posts. You can click on that and then within the forum, click unread. That to me was the cleanest way to do it. Um, but I'd, I'd also like to hear any thoughts. I know, Lisey, this was kind of your soapbox issue <laughs> as far as trying to make a response to an, uh, an unread thread or to continue a discussion in a, in a previous thread. Any thoughts on that, Lisey? Good or bad? Well, I, uh, by the end, I learned how to navigate it, but anybody who's new to the system, uh, I would suggest just spending some time getting to know how those responses are ordered and how to maintain um, track of what I've answered or what who you've responded to and who you haven't. I found it very challenging, but uh, it just took practice and I wish we had a better system, but like you, we have to love what is. <laughs> exactly. Like for example, you're going to quickly be very frustrated. It doesn't go in reverse. You can't change it to a reverse state order. Um, so it's always, it defaults and remains. Um, the first post that was made in the forum stays at the top. And so as you're getting these, I think our introductory forum had a thousand posts. So if you want to get to the last post, you literally have to scroll to the last screen or just click the, as I said, the unread button. Um, yeah. But you know, that's, that's, that's kind of crazy. That's what I, I found uh, with the unread. The unfortunate thing I ran into was that I was either doing it between my phone, my tablet, or a desktop, and it didn't always translate what had been read in those cases for whatever reason. Um, and I had a sec, oh, the subscription, like, so I think like when you reply to somebody, I think you can actually subscribe to that thread, can you not? So if they reply back, then like, that's one way to kind of keep that communication loop closed is that once they reply then you'll be notified you won't have to think about it on later in the day and then think oh i need to go check actively if that person has replied or not right that's a great point <clears throat> and there are and i put a link in our one of our emails we've had recently the instructor guides are actually outstanding that canvas puts together the only problem for us it's really geared for say faculty at a college who is going to be using this for a semester long course and designing their entire course. It's just so much overkill for our purposes. But if there is a specific, specific question you ha may have about the, uh, the, say the discussion forum or how to use the calendar feature or whatever it may be, um, I just really encourage you to check the instructor guides because they are very good. And I've, I am completely self-taught using this and I've, you know, somehow I'm surviving. So it's, it's, it's you know, pretty decent from that standpoint. Um, and Cheryl, there's Cheryl. I didn't know Cheryl was with us. Hi, Cheryl. On the settings, I asked to be notified if someone posted. Okay, good. Okay, so I didn't do that. Okay, so that's a cool feature that I did not use. And I think, JR, that's what you were just talking about. Is that right, JR? It's probably the same idea. 
which Cheryl uh, commented. Sorry, I just needed to get my microphone back. Um, yeah, that's so I used it on some, and then uh, I think at one part in the course, I forgot how to do that again. So yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to um, but it, it's a really good feature. Okay, very good. Um, okay, well, I think I'm going to leave the discussion moderation topic behind unless there's anything on that. Um, Why did you have an X over that plus discussion? Ah, thank you. So I, as discussion moderators, um, there are various per permissions that I can grant people in the course. And um, so the discussion moderators um, have the ability to create a new discussion. And so please don't do that. Um, you'll, what you'll do is you'll go into an existing discussion and see the um, post, and then you'll make your new post within the discussion. So <laughs> just, yeah, don't, don't start a new discussion. It should just be comments within the existing, uh, within the existing discussions. Yeah, thanks for that. Also, Jennifer, I noticed uh, last time that uh, you let us know that so many people were just posting things just to get credit without really having any substance, and you have a lot of deleted posts. That's a good point. That's an excellent point, and I feel so bad. I don't know if Camille's on the line. Camille's um, in a totally different, I think she's in a 12-hour different time zone, so um, I don't think she's with us tonight, but poor Camille last year was, um, or last semester, was trying to help a student, and we quickly realized, not quickly, unfortunately, it took about a day for me to realize the student was simply taking a copy and paste from other parts of the course and Camille and I were like, what is this person saying? It was just, it turned out to be kind of looking like gibberish. And um, so unfortunately, it's the nature of the MOOC beast. Um, some folks want this crazy badge. <laughs> so they'll just put junk in gibberish and I'll have to go through it. And we didn't have anything that was, you know, profane or anything. But it was all just mainly people who were just trying to post their way through the course to get to the badge module to open. And so every once in a while, then you'll see just a bunch of deleted posts and that's just me going through taking out the, the gibberish. Okay, well, speak now forever, hold your peace on that. <laughs> All right, so we'll move on now to um, talk a little bit about OER Commons. Um, maybe this would be helpful for those that were, um, again, um, kind of picking on Janet here, but you used it probably the most of, of some of us. I know Ruth Sugar was also a, um, a participant in the last class. Um, maybe you could give us kind of a bird's eye. What, what were your thoughts of using open author within OER Commons? Uh, I thought that the, the instructional videos were great. They were a bit over, of overkill. Um, I felt, but, but that's good because I think all of us enter this at a different place. Uh, and I felt like I was able to complete everything um, properly and easily. So I appreciated that. Um, yeah. So it's the, basically like a Google Doc, right? Like when you yes. really get it, that's how I usually describe it to people. Absolutely. It was just, it was very directive, um, easy to navigate. And, um, and when you, you, and basically it's instantaneous, all of a sudden you have your lesson there and it looks fantastic. So <laughs> it yeah. feels good when it, when it happens. So. And, um, and one point of confusion that happened between when we designed the course in, um, in you know, for completed designing the course in January and then when we went live with the class, um, OER Commons actually opened up two additional authoring tools. Um, one is geared, geared toward K-12, the other for higher ed, and they really are um, getting a lot more uh, and closer anyway to what I would consider like an e-learning module. And so we steered students away from that, again, with the idea that a lot of our focus really is on the face-to-face -face classroom and developing lesson plans for the instructor. And so we did see a couple people didn't quite get that memo, and um, they did create lessons within Lesson Builder and, and the Module Builder. And they just don't have the same functionality, and it, again, it's for a different type of lesson, but geared more toward an online lesson. So we're sticking with the idea that they should continue to use Open Author. Um, so you may see that, and when you open up, you'll notice that when you open up the student's um, document, it, it just looks different. It will be a, the lesson will be at a different format. But again, the whole idea is trying to get them steered back to using Open Author. Any questions about Open Author or OER Commons? Anybody having trouble logging in? Probably not, I'm guessing. 
I always appreciated that you were there to deal with the technical problems and I didn't have to. Yeah, there really weren't many. And what I would just to give every Buddy that wasn't involved last year, uh, as Lisa's saying, I would usually just do a quick screenshot. I thought the technical issues would be a bigger deal, but as Janet mentioned, it's just pretty straightforward. If you can use an, a Google Doc, you can use Open Author. Um, so we had a few formatting type questions, but that was pretty much um, pretty much it. And just for those that aren't familiar with it, um, you can um, attach documents like a PDF. You can embed a YouTube video. Um, so it could be used in some ways as uh, like a blended learning tool where, you know, depending on how you bend it and, and shape it, 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 but it's not really, it's, it, you really can't consider it like an e-learning authoring tool. It really, that would be stretching it, a, stretching it a tad, I think. Um, okay, let's move on then. So um, when we talk about the design guide, this is where we're laying out what the project requirements are. And so um, it's a, this is a Google Doc, so it's the bottom here. I'll click on it real quick to take you to what it looks like if you haven't seen it recently. So we lay out, um, there we go. Come on, play nice. It's a long document, it's 12 pages long. Um, but this is really for the benefit of the students to give them um, the, the requirements for what they're designing. So they start out, and I'm going to try to get myself to the top here. Um, there's two, three parts. Um, part one is a lesson description, and this serves several purposes. Um, one is once the lesson is up on OER Commons, the lesson description is going to provide a lot of um, data that OER Commons and other search engines will be able to use to, um, to pull back the resource when people go in and search so that you can put in keywords, there's going to be an abstract, um, and then it'll also give um, clues to the instructor on the nature of the lesson, how much time is going to be required to complete it, um, what standards it's aligning to, and things like that. Then the part two is the lesson itself. So this is where the, um, it's, it's getting into a true lesson plan, talking about the instructional strategies and having any of the um, worksheets or readings or practice activities. Um, that will all be um, within section two. And then the third part is um, it's simply where they're going to be documenting their resources and references that they used. And we really are encouraging this whole idea. Part of the course is talking about um, licensing and um, attribution and so we're encouraging best practices um, by having them complete part three that would be like a reference section for their for their lesson and then in terms of how this um, design guide functions um, the blue boxes are guides for our students in our course and the idea is they'll delete they delete those boxes when they complete it so when they'll they'll complete what they're working on and then come back through and delete all these blue boxes. And I think that was your, that was your handiwork, wasn't it, JR, to come up with the, uh, the blue boxes? Tell them how to fill out the form. <laughs> exactly, how to fill out the form. So it's pretty self-explanatory, and I think we've made um, a few tweaks based on feedback. Um, for example, Lisi, you've talked, um, uh, made a good case for us to, we used to have a restriction that we tried to keep the lesson to very short bite micro lessons of 15 to 30 minutes and Lisi and others made a strong case to eliminate that restriction. And so that's kind of one of the fundamental changes in the design guide. Otherwise, it's pretty similar to what we had in the past. Any questions about the design guide? Comments? Uh, I would add that I, I think I sent you that today, but there is a lot of emphasis in the materials themselves to have these lessons address real world problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my opinion, it would be nice to, I know the students last time got very confused between what was, because they'd have a lesson that addressed the standards and the standards are academic and yet they were asked to focus on a real world problem. So um, I would like to see um, something stated here and there that yes, we have to address standards, but that the standards don't represent the focus of the lesson. The lesson, if you're teaching adults, you need to have real world problems. And uh, I worked a lot with students on that last time to try to help them understand the difference between academic skills and uh, 
in real world situations because that's how we bait and hook adults. So um, uh, I don't know, I'd like to see more the topic being real life. I'd like to see the objectives being real life and then embedding all of the standards into the implementation of projects that include real life problems. And I think where that's coming in, I, I don't know if you can see the screen here, Lisey, um, is um, making a, an additional bullet point probably right off the top here um, and squishing down um, the, the, the standards. And then I'll, I think you mentioned in your email to me, um, I've incorporating it right here where we talk about the the, stand, the English language arts um, and the math, right? Instead of just focusing yeah. on it as a topic yeah. area, talk about embedding it in, in a real world context. Yeah. Yes. So I'll work on that. I'll, I got Thank that on my to-do list. That's the top top of the to-do list. It's a good All one. All right. And Jennifer, I don't know if it'd be helpful. I can send you something on contextualization, like a toolkit. Yes. Maybe. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I would love that. Thank you. I, I just, if you don't mind, I just want to say one thing. And there, there were several people who were creating lessons that were about grammar and just about sentence structure. And, and I think that Lisa, you, you know, you really addressed that well. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I, I just think I'd like to screen capture some of those comments you made in reply, uh, talking about the adult, um, hooking an adult learner and I and I think that you know the, I, I wonder if anybody has any thoughts about this am I alone in, in saying that you know when when designers come forward with you know just a strictly grammar type lesson about the noun that you know it's important but it needs to be in context so what, what are your thoughts am I alone in this or I just do you get my drift no totally <laughs> Yeah, please, please, please comment on her question because I'd like to hear it. I think I think we're all in agreement that that's what needs to happen. I, I don't know how you managed it in the past, but I think that's very true. That's the whole direction of all the instruction that our professional development teachers across the country, and and that's the whole direction is to contextualize the standards. They're not standalone. There's and even a move to include like employability skills. Um, standards with your uh, CPRs within a context again so that you get more bang for your buck um, but not I mean I, I, gone are the days or you should walk in a classroom and they're just you know they're conjugating words on the on the, uh, on the board so um, I, I think it's it's I think we're all in a, I hope I think we're all on the same page with that so. I hope that those days are gone, but I'm not sure they are in a lot of cases. <laughs> and so, I agree. And if, and if some designers don't have experience in the classroom, then they may feel that it's a, this is a life skill to know how to conjugate, you know, sentences. So it's just, it's a, a shift. Well, and it's kind of like the Khan Academy approach. I don't mean to, you know, where they're teaching to straight, that's great for, a refresh or a review or to drill but it, I mean that shouldn't be instruction you know that's something a student can do on their own and wouldn't need an instructor mm -hmm. right so um, it, it is changing it's shifting the, the culture and the adult education classroom too because traditionally it's not been done that way and worksheets and all the rote, rote kinds of ways of learning have been introduced uh, in the ESL world, uh, which is my expertise area as to why I'm here, uh, grammar, I think, 20 years ago, started contextualizing things. We no longer could teach um, noun for the sake of noun. It didn't make any sense. Um, I, I ran into this, and I think uh, a few times I commented, and Lucy definitely, we were trying to push them or encourage them to contextualize it, but I don't think we know how to do it um, uh, because they themselves were taught that a noun, what a noun is and the definition of a noun and the few types of nouns, etc. So when you tell them that, okay, based on the context of your, uh, of your population, what is the place of a noun? Why, why do they need to know the plural noun versus the apostrophe S noun or the whatever else, other form of conjugation. I think um, 
that's an that's a sh for many um, that would be a shortcoming that they don't know how to do it. So even in the discussion board, when we're giving them feedback all of the parts that they are submitting, that you know, think about you know making this a contest. We, I think, I think I did a couple times out of those thousands, but maybe more. But I think we need to providing them with that sample feedback um, in terms of like a, a little mini well within the feedback about how to contextualize it. This is how you do it, not say just do it. So, um, I, I, like Ed loves loves the feedback, and it's funny we, we hit on grammar tonight and ES, um, ESL because the example um, Amanda back channel channeled me a couple weeks ago with some videos, um, and I, I pulled them up here. It's with maybe you folks have heard of um, this organization. Um, if I can find it, where are they at? Uh, of course, it's not coming right. Oh, here, New American Horizons Horizons Foundation. They have um, several videos that are taken within their classroom, and. So the lesson um, that I pulled out and highlighted, which hopefully gets to, um, oops, let's see, I don't want to listen to that, hang on. Um, there we go, turn the volume off there. Um, it's a lesson, a uh, gra grammar lesson at an ESL classroom on, uh, the example here is on uh, past and present tense. And so if, I would, I'd love for your feedback on if you think, I won't go through the details of it here, but if you take a peek at it, it's, um, it's in module two, um, yeah, module two under um, instructional focus, real world problems and tasks. Um, and it was one of the best examples that I could find of where a teacher was trying to do exactly what we're talking about. And she was using it, the reason she's doing it is she was saying she noticed like, for example, on a job interview, students were really struggling when, when they were trying to describe their life events, they were using the wrong tense. And so the lesson she used, she used her life as an example, and she had major milestones in her exam, in her life, and she had pictures of like for when she when she was a baby, when she had a baby, and then she you know had like these various um, engagement activities where the, the students would respond to that. So I'm, I'd be curious if you thought this was a good example of what we're talking about, um, or if you have better ones. I guess that would be my request, is to take a peek at this and then let me know if this is hitting uh, at, at, at least a, a good first attempt at trying to give people an example of what we're talking about. And, and Michelle, did you say you, do you have some good examples, some video or some lesson plans or something of this that, that I could embed in the class? Well, I do have a toolkit and I have, I, I'll, I have some instructional videos. I'll just have to look for, I think, I think ESL traditionally has been better at contextualizing instruction. It's just because it's the nature of what they they do, and so I think for it's more of a new concept for ABE and ASE teachers to think about contextualizing instruction. So um, I I will I also have a friend who I think for math especially I think it's good for them to see what that looks like in a math classroom to contextualize the instruction with, around a certain content area. Um, but, uh, so I know I can get some math ones for sure. Yeah, math but. is where we're, I think even Janet, you mentioned some of our, uh, most of our examples tend to be <laughs> for whatever reason uh, in English language arts. So math would be fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, Lisey, does that sit well with you? I know this has kind of been your, hot button issue does do you like the approach we're taking trying to get him some examples or you know putting in in this idea of contextualization uh, great yeah perfect i examples are the best way to go uh i just uh, posted something on links today uh as an example of that just a real quick and dirty i'll send it to you yeah that would on be how to have a life skill and then have academic skills embedded but the objectives are life i'll send you that just as an example but well yeah i think that's right on thanks everybody yeah i appreciate it um okay and then we'll, we'll go pretty quickly i've got about seven minutes here um within the hour um i'm not going to spend much time on it we really have I don't want to say de-emphasize the college and career readiness standards, but we really led with it last time. And as we're talking, we certainly hinted at and maybe even punched in the nose already, um, the, the idea that the college readiness are really a way for, your, for you to uh, align the, the lesson that you're, you're working on to the standards and to, and to use them. I think they're great to be used as a guide when you're coming up with your objectives to make sure that you're 
framing them appropriately anyway. That's kind of the way I look at it. And I think unfortunately last time we kind of had them start there, like picking a, pick a, pick a, um, a standard and then design a lesson around it, which turned out to be kind of backwards, unfortunately, and, and confusing. Maybe that would work for a very, very senior um, educator, but um, we certainly had some troubles with it working with some the novice designers. It was a, it was a challenge. And Jennifer, I might mention they're coming out with the ESL standards this fall sometime. So I don't know when that will be. It's you. Okay. And you know what? You mentioned it. And I hate to ask you to just sit here and spend your day tomorrow um, sending me emails, but you mentioned the um, workplace standards. I've kind of struggled. To find, uh -huh. Yeah, I've, I've struggled trying to get my hands on something like that. If you okay, can, I can I can send you this. a link to that. Sure. I don't know if we'll bombard them with that this time, but maybe as JR is saying, I get, JR just committed us to a third <laughs> a third move, so maybe in round three. Well, even when we talk about contextualization, it's something we can bring in. I'm also going to send you like an instructional map that has a way for them to link all these different standards within a context and start to think about the activities and the assessments. I don't know. Just that's send you great. something. That's, you. that's great. That's, and a lot of this might be um, perfect for us to put in our supplementary material section so we can have it sitting there. And when people do have questions within the discussion board, we can point them to it um, for additional um, you know, supporting documentation, that would be great. Um, and then I'm just going to breeze through this because I think um, I kind of hit home on this a couple other times. Um, we, we embed our instructional framework on Merrill's first principles, which just happen to um, be very, very close to the WAPIA framework where, you know, you start up with your problem and your task and um, through warm-up exercises and introduction and it, it really they nearly are identical when you really drill down to them. But the, I think what the nice thing about the uh, first principles are for those that are interested, we, it really ties it back to the theory and the research, um, which some of the other materials we had didn't. So um, I, th I was, I, that was one part of the course I didn't make a lot of changes in. We, we pretty much kept that the same as last time. It seemed to work pretty well. All right. Well, with four minutes to spare, I'm at the end of my, my agenda. Did anybody want to pick up another topic we didn't mention or circle back to something else? Yes, thank you, Jennifer, again and again. Oh, I think, no, you guys are, you're the heart and soul of this. This is great. I just I really thank everybody. Um, and then I, as far as what, what things will look like, as long as we have a couple minutes, I'll just uh, give you a, a little idea what's going to come up in the next couple of weeks the way we did it last time the day the course goes live I send out an announcement it goes out to the cor uh, course participants as an email you'll get a copy then as well just saying welcome to the class you know here's what you should probably do the first week and uh, remind them that there's a webinar and um, what our role will really be the first week is just meet and greet and so um, the main focus um, on that, we've got um, Sundi, we've got Cheryl, we've got um, Janet and myself, and we're just greeters <laughs> standing by the door as people come in. And uh, we were pretty obnoxious. I think we pretty much replied to everybody who made a post. But really, people, I think you'll find it pretty, for those of you who, weren't, who didn't participate, people really pour their heart and soul out in their introductory um, comments. A lot of folks talked about their first generation um, going to college and how their parents, that one person, for example, mentioned um, her parents. Um, pursued their GEDs in their 60s and you know so you'll hear stories like that and it's kind of hard just to let somebody put post that and then not make a comment so I think pretty much without exception when someone would post we would um, you know make sure we included some type of personal welcome um, and I think that was a nice um, I thought that was nice I think I think the introductory section was probably one of my most fun parts of the class um, and then we got to business when we got to modules one and two and, and think, you know, the tone changed a little bit, but um, any other thoughts on the welcome week? I think that was about it. Do you do basically just allow one person to welcome one person or, you know, if it's something really extensive, then more than one person can welcome them or. Yeah. You know? And you know, okay. it's just, it, it tends to, it tends to, it was very organic. I mean, we didn't, we didn't really, we didn't have like, okay, you take all the A, you know, <laughs> the A through, you know, M's, I'll take the N through Z's or anything. It wasn't like that at all. We just, um, 
It's very mm -hmm. organic. And then what we really found too is that we did have a lot of peer to peer. For example, someone would say they went went to undergrad somewhere, and then someone would you know go off on a tangent about football or whatever it may be. So um, you know, there, there's a lot of that in the introductory posts. But it, to me, that that first week is really just setting the stage that this is not your typical MOOC. We're a community. We're trying to you know, peer to get the peer to peer and the peer to facilitator interaction happening, kind of hitting the ground running with that as our concept. So, okay, well, with one minute to spare, thank you everybody so much. And um, please do back channel me some resources or questions uh, and we'll see you on the 12th. I'll virtually see you on the 12th. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you.